Today, we have Julia Louis-Dreyfus. And so for a lot of our listeners, that's all I need to say. Just, that's, that's who we got. Fast forward 15 seconds. For those of you who don't know, uh, I mean, she started out on SNL, but that's often forgotten because she played Elaine in Seinfeld. And then she was um, the, the vice president in Veep. So uh, I don't know. I mean, she's, she's carved out a singular space in American pop culture and comedy. She's got nine SAG Awards, eight Emmy Awards, two Critics' Choice Awards, a Golden Globe, and in 2018, she won the very prestigious Mark Twain Prize for American Humor. Penn, is it true you pooped your pants doing a TikTok in front of her? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I'm just appreciating the way you said pooped. <laughs> Yeah, because here's was, what adults say, Nava. Boop. They shit themselves. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, rumor has it. Rumor has it, guys. Rumor has it. Stick around. <laughs> Welcome to Pod Crushed. We're your hosts. I'm Penn. I'm Nava. And I'm Sophie. And I think we would have been your middle school besties. Fighting over whether we're team Britney or Christina. Oh, guys, it's Britney, bitch. <laughs> it will start this way. It will start now. Okay. Hello. Now? Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. <laughs> welcome, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. I, I have to ask, can you give us a snapshot of middle school Julia, where you were physically, spiritually, mentally, you know, what was going on? Well, I am very happy not to be in middle school anymore, and I'm very happy not to be that age. I developed early. Hmm. Are we talking about that kind of thing on this yeah, show? Yeah, Anything sure. you want to talk about, Julia? Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, anyway, I developed early. <laughs> yeah. And um and I was uh, at on one hand I was happy to, to, you know, be getting breasts and so on and so forth, and on the other hand, I was very unhappy with my body all at the same time. It was a mashup. I was just not super confident. I was uh Oh, God. Yeah, it was just miserable, actually. I'm thinking about it now. Like, I remember I remember once there was this dance, and um, there was this dance with boys. And that's what, that's what started to happen. That's right. They used to have, like, uh, mixers. So you'd have with the boys' school, and so there'd be a dance. And the day of the mixer, I got my period. And, oh, my gosh. Yeah. And I remember... Being so, like, not knowing what to do. Uh, this is too intimate. All of a sudden, I'm all. I realize <laughs> okay. everything I'm about to say. Well. <laughs> but I, I like. Uh, I gotta get out of here. I can try and pump the brakes. We can edit. There are a lot of edit. period stories on our yeah, show. Yeah, we, we, we've had company. so many of them. Yeah. Surprisingly, so Penn so. has a period story, which has made yeah. it onto the show. That so. is surprising. I'm dying to hear about that. <laughs> Um, anyway, I, I I just remember it very vividly uh, coming into the dance, and I was wearing, I think I was wearing pants, but I was feeling un very uncomfortable in my own skin, and I was wearing a Kotex na a sanitary napkin, and I remember doing like a thing where I was looking at my girlfriends, and I was sort of like like. I, I was. I tried to make a joke about it, and I was sort of like walked in, kind of like into sort of a squatting, and I thought it was funny. And then after I did, I thought, oh, that's not funny. And no, it uh, is. And it was. It actually it is funny, isn't it? Yeah, in the telling, it is really funny. Yeah, but I don't think anybody. I I, think, I remember my memory is everybody sort of peeled away from me <laughs> at that point. But anyway, yeah, it's not a great time. Julia, did you know how to talk to boys since you were at an all-girls school? Like, did you try no, to I approach boys at that dance? Mm. In fact, when I was really little, like when I was in fifth grade, we took, uh, uh, I took a dance class, like a cotillion type of class, you know? Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time, and, you know, we were so young, fifth grade. I mean, that like they would have a break in the middle of this dance class where you learn the foxtrot or the, you know, the box, I don't know, whatever. And the boys, they would give us cookies and juice and the boys would like spit ice at the girls. That was, that was <laughs> the, the way they flirted, <laughs> if you can call it that. But I do remember the first time I, uh, in the class, I sort of touched a boy and I put my hand on his shoulder and my other hand in his hand. And I remember thinking, oh, wow, his shoulder feels like a regular shoulder. Oh, oh my gosh, that's wow. really yeah. cute. That's very tiny. Yeah, <laughs> like he is. A, he is a human being. Yeah. He's another person, <laughs> just like me. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And 
I remember, at, I think it was at that same dance class that I was uh, uh, dancing with the boy once, and we were sort of spinning around doing some sort of whatever the move was, around and around, and all of a sudden, he leans in, and he just kisses me really quick. And then he sort of pulled back, and he goes, who did that? <laughs> 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 was was that genuine? Like he, that was not. He some didn't know. Shame. He did. I think it just came out of his mouth. I I, I don't know, That's and I didn't even so respond. Funny. Yeah. Who did that? Julia, you told this story about having this Kotex pad between your legs and, and doing a bit, and I just thought, oh my gosh. Okay, she was obviously already so funny because I think about myself at that age. I would have never done that. I think I would have like maybe retreated instead. And mm. so I think it's so interesting that that was your natural instinct. And I wonder, what was humor like for you at that time in your life? Did you already know you were funny? How were you using it? No, I don't. I mean, it's not that I thought I was unfunny, but it was just sort of baked in. I guess it's my sort of go-to. And I think in our family, it was sort of there's a culture of uh, making jokes and cracking up all very much enjoy laughing uh, in inappropriate moments. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a piece of it anyway, but mm -hmm. yeah. Would you seek comedy out specifically or like no. what kind of art were you gravitating to at that age? Um, Do you remember? Any kind of performance. It didn't matter what kind. I, I was just, uh, um, uh, you know, getting in school plays. I mean, I did the cherry orchard. I was, I was uh, uh, head of the thespian society. I was mm. just like, all as many plays and shows as I could possibly get fit into the year. And I still feel just amazed that I'm able to do this for a living because it was really then an extracurricular activity that, you know, you had to still get your homework done. You had to, you know, study for this exam. But I was like desperate to get to rehearsal or work on the performance. That's what I was really laser focused on. So the fact that now it is a focus is uh, a complete treasure. Uh, Julia, I listened to a few episodes of your podcast, Wiser Than Me, and I was listening to the episode with Fran Lebowitz, and she said that her mother told her, boys don't like funny girls. Right. And you talked about that briefly, and you talked about how maybe there is some truth to that because there's, there's a lot of power in humor. And I wonder, what was your experience being a funny person at that age around boys? Did you, did you notice that? Yeah, I, know, I certainly grew up with, I mean, not all boys feel that way, mm -hmm. but I certainly knew boys who uh, m might some, uh, not recoil exactly, but not like if a girl was being sort of, assertively funny. Mm -hmm. I, I know those kind of boys. And they're not boys we want to be with, yes. FYI. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, no, that's important. I think that being funny is a, a great, uh, it can be a great sort of superpower in certain si situations. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I, I, I know I've asked a lot of questions <laughs> in a row, but I will ask this one and then I will, I will zip it. But why? Uh, Why? Isn't this what we're supposed to be doing? Because I'm a boy who doesn't, yeah. I don't prefer just like power and speak. humor <laughs> coming from my co-host. So if you could just zip it up after this. Okay. <laughs> I will. That's my plan. No, I have to tell you, Julia, that I am obsessed with the fact that you talk to your mom at the end of your yeah. podcast episodes. <laughs> oh, I, good. When people ask me my career goals, I'm like, it's to start a podcast with my mom. That's my ultimate. That's, that's my ultimate plan. And um, I just by love the way, why does it have to be ultimate? Just do it. I know. I well, know. She's on this one right now. Yeah, but <laughs> she can do two. <laughs> yeah, she can do two. So do you want to do two podcasts? No, <laughs> we do two. No, I don't know. I think you um, have to. Julia's told you to do it. I Sophie. know. I yes. might. I might. And I just love that you call your mom at the end of the episodes, and. I wonder about your relationship with your mom. Has it always been close? Uh, what was it like in middle school? How has it evolved over the years? I also mm. know, I also heard in an episode of your podcast that you entered into therapy with her at the age, or like around 60, which I think is incredible yeah, is awesome. and probably was such a rich experience. So yeah, anything you can tell us about your relationship with your mom and how that's evolved? My mom and dad divorced when I was a baby. 
And right around the time that they divorced, her father uh, actually died by suicide. So it was just her and me uh, for, you know, uh, almost four years. We were kind mm -hmm. of this duo. And, um, uh, and I think that being a new mom, she was, you know, young. She was uh, 27 when wow. uh, I was born. And being a new mom uh, uh, under these circumstances that were challenging, to say the least, uh, the, the mothering part was, I think, kind of a savior for her mm -hmm. um, in terms of keeping her sanity. And then she uh, married my wonderful stepfather, and um, my dad married uh, my wonderful stepmother. And so I was a member of two families. Hmm. And so um, I would say that we, we have a, a very strong connection just based on even just what I just told you, you know. Yeah. Um, my mother, she's a writer, and uh, she is a poet. And she, at the age, I'm going to say of... I believe 75, maybe 80, oh, she published her first book of poetry. And oh, so, wow. yeah, she is somebody who is intellectually curious, which is why I thought it would be fun to fold her into these conversations on Wiser Than Me because she's, um, she's an intellect and mm. she does things like she goes on, she's 89, she goes on theater trips, she goes to lectures, she takes classes. This this woman's a dynamo. So she's very much my uh, role model, in, uh, certainly when it comes to aging and how to embrace life fully. Mm. Actually, that spirit of your podcast, I, I have to say I really loved it, but I didn't even realize why until I was kind of deep in it. And the way that you're speaking about maturity and i mean that literally like getting older which hopefully means in a lot of ways getting wiser right and the fact that i mean we all know this but like you just don't hear women in high profile public places at least speaking about age in this way you d you're doing it so directly so naturally without hesitation without any like it, it I, I didn't even think about it. You know what I mean? It was just like, oh, this is like, this is interesting. It's compelling. All of this makes sense. You're having incredible people reflect on their lives and what they've learned, which is like, yeah, why wouldn't we want that? And yet you right. realize there's this crazy barrier, mm -hmm. for, I think for all people, but of course, a unique one for women. There's a unique barrier, like that's not spoken about in this way. And you actually, I feel like in your first episode with Jane Fonda, you're, you're re or maybe you're even saying in the intro, you're talking about how like, half of the world's population, we're not getting their wisdom, Yeah, you know? And it's like... Look what we're missing out yeah, on. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah, we could benefit from this, you know? Yeah. You know, we're sitting on a gold mine. We're sitting on a gold mine here. How much money is the podcast making? Yeah. Right now? <laughs> <laughs> ka ching, ka ching, ka ching. That's, That's all why I'm you started say. it. <laughs> yeah, I, I started it for the money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Julia, just while we're on the topic, what's been the most surprising part of the podcast or like anything that's sort of come up again and again? Like, what are you gleaning mm. from it that maybe you didn't expect to? Well, I mean, you know, there are certain things that people have said, of course that I take to heart, I think both Ruth Reichel and Amy Tan both said, talked about doing things that frighten you mm -hmm. uh, and how important that is. <laughs> but I think, you know, generally speaking, it's made me happy doing this podcast. Mm -hmm. I've just, I've really, truly enjoyed these conversations. You know, I, I, I'm authentically curious to hear from these people. And actually, in fact, when I was speaking to Isabel Allende, she, I, I made a joke. I said, my God, she was describing her life and how good she's feeling right now. I, I, I can't remember how old she is. I think she's 82 or 83. And as she was sort of characterizing where she's at, I, I had this feeling like, God, I can't wait to be in my 80s. Mm. Aww. For real. I mean, it was like, uh, th there's a lot of stuff that you can let go of. Mm, yeah. I think it's hard to be young. Yeah. At, yeah. Actually, by and that's the way. what you say in that in your first episode. That's right. And that's kind of yeah. why we do what we do. Exactly. You know, it's that's like the what, beginning of all of this. That's the beginning. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You're at the beginning. Yeah. I'm doing the end. 
ish. <laughs> but the but I mean, it is hard to be young, and there's an enormous amount to look forward to as you age. And the more experience you get, it's just you can, I think, maybe relax into your into yourself, hopefully. So much. I mean, even as like I'm 36 and I know that sounds very young, but like it's not 20. No, it's and, not. And, and I feel better than ever. Like the pressure mm. from like about 14 to 24 was just immense like that. I period. think being in your 20s sucks, actually. It can, you know. I think it can be really difficult, you know? And I was, by the way, I was working and stuff in my yeah. 20s, yeah. but I didn't, there was so much, mm, what's the word, uh, 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 discomfort. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I, I like, uh, I, I personally, it's, it's made me feel even happier about getting older. I'm happy you're doing it. Thanks. Julia, we have a couple more questions about adolescence, and then we'll talk about your amazing, illustrious career. Um, but we have a question we ask everyone, which is to share about their first love and heartbreak. Well, I mean, I <laughs> I had a boyfriend in high school um, who I was really, I really liked him a lot. And then I found out that he was... Uh, cheating on me with his uh, girlfriend that he'd had before. Mm. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm, not I'm not saying anybody's names. I have yeah. to be very yeah. careful. Probably, probably best. So I, had, I told him, I gave him an ultimatum, and I said, it's, got, it's either me or her. And, of course, he chose her. Oh. So that was a real yeah. bummer. And then, again, back to another fucking dance there was a dance <laughs> and there was this and my mom made me a dress uh and this was this is the 70s now there was a uh dress label and they had fabrics too it was called lily pulitzer i don't know if it's around anymore i don't mm -hmm. it probably isn't it very like preppy it. Okay, very preppy, sort of bright colors. And my mom made me a super cute dress um, that I wore to the dance with this Lily Pulitzer fabric and really cute ribbon straps. It was actually pretty fab. <laughs> and um, I got to the dance, and God damn it, if that other girlfriend, the one who made the cut, as it were, was wearing a dress in the same fabric. <gasps> no, Julia. Yes. That is really like a movie. My mother made it. Yeah. Isn't that's, that weird? That's crazy. That's scripted. Yeah. It's like yeah. she, she spied insane. on your mom. <laughs> yeah. The fabric shop. Not, not cool. Not cool. <laughs> I want to ask about your new movie. Um, sure. Which is called You Hurt My Feelings. And in the movie, which we had an opportunity to screen, it looks like one of the central themes is sort of how family members hurt each other's feelings the most when they're actually trying to encourage each other. And I, I was wondering if that, like, resonates with you. And there, I don't want to, like, give anything away, but there's this amazing scene where you find out your husband feels a different way than you thought, and you're trying to say that you don't care, but you obviously are, like, emotionally, like, really, really caring. And I was wondering how that is for you and Brad. Has there ever been a project that he wasn't that enthusiastic about? Or are you guys able to talk about that candidly? The movie centers around this couple who are um, have had a long and happy marriage, um, she's a novelist, and her husband is a therapist, and she's just written her second book, and um, she hasn't heard from her agent about it, and et cetera, et cetera, and her husband keeps, he's been read multiple drafts, he keeps telling her how much he loves it, he thinks it's fantastic, it's a wonderful book, you know, feel good about it, et cetera, et cetera, only then does she overhear him uh, saying uh, to her brother-in-law how much he uh, hates the book, uh, and her world is rocked to the core. So the movie is about, uh, obviously, truthfulness and honesty in relationships, and also um, it also examines, I think, uh, like, are you your work? Who are you separate from your work? Mm -hmm. What is your worth separate from your work. Mm. And um, so with my husband, I, I do very much rely on his input for uh, projects that I do, you know, it, be it a script, be it an edit. I'm always going to him for, um, I, I, I need his thoughts. I need his brain. In fact, I'll say, can you put your brain on this? Mm. And um, 
So I do rely on that, and I also rely on him to tell me the truth. So if something is not working, he'll tell me. And he's, mm-hmm. and he's you know, he's kind about it if, if it's, a, if it's a, a proper criticism. He, he, he can find a way to be kind about it. And sometimes we might argue. But it is, um, and, and vice versa, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, but I rely on that. As a creative person, I really rely on his, uh, uh, on, on his brain. <laughs> I find that to be so relatable. My husband, David, is a producer on the show, but he is an artist, and I'm also an artist. I'm a visual artist mostly, and he's a musician. And I mm. really rely on his brain. Um, he doesn't rely so much on my brain for his work, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I rely on his brain. And, um, we've had to like time and time again, when I like show him a project, something I'm working on, it's time for him to give feedback because he will be honest with me and thoughtful. Um, but we've had to really figure out what is the best way. I'm also sensitive. So, um, yeah, yeah it's just, it's very relatable. I think that's, that's a hard thing as an artist to separate yourself from the things that you create. Totally. And in our industry, I feel like in particular, it's it it subsumes people and their and their families. You know, and not I don't necessarily always mean it in a negative way, but it's just like your the hours alone are all consuming. They can yes, be. They can be. Yeah. Um, and then and then just uh, yeah, just like the the impact of like a successful artistic person in a family, I think can be can be just huge. You know. Mm-hmm. Totally. You've been a part of 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 a handful of really iconic things. Mm. Something that we think a lot about here is the theme of rejection. Ah, uh, yeah. And there's something that you've spoken a lot about in terms of like when you first got on SNL, you were with Larry David. Uh, you speak about like just feeling kind of, or at least he was feeling quite shafted on the show. And oh, you, I was shafted right? too. You, yeah, 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 for sure. So you're having this like. What well, surely felt like you, in a way, you'd gotten to the summit already. Oh yeah. And then you were feeling immediately rejected. Like was like, that? Like this isn't at all what I thought it was going to yeah. be. Yeah. It was hard. It was very difficult. I mean, I had no idea how to perform in front of a in front of a a a, a live television audience. I didn't go there with a a bag of characters, a bag of tricks that I could pull out and and. <clears throat> do X, Y, or Z in a sketch. I did not have that. I was just, uh, I-, I thought people would just write for me and I would <laughs> do funny sketches, you know, but it's not like that. You, It's pretty, um, it, it it wasn't like that then. It was kind of pretty dog eat dog. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was a rough go, but I learned a lot. It was like going to graduate school. I was there for three years. I learned a lot. I grew up a lot. Uh, you know, I didn't come out of that show a star by any means. In fact, hardly, nothing. Mm. Uh, but I came out with experience. I had a lot of experience after that. And I think it helped me uh, figure out my certain kinds of priorities that I had from a creative point of view. So that was good. Julia, sort of Lauren Michaels famously came on, cleaned house. You were one of the people who was let go. And I'm sorry to ask you to revisit a dark day potentially, but I am curious, no, like, what was the next day like for you? Do you remember it? No, I don't. I just mm. assumed I, I wasn't. Can I tell you something? I was so uh, low on the totem pole mm. that it wasn't even a consideration that I would have been kept there. Mm. I mean, I, I and I didn't get a call like you're not coming back. Mm. Huh. I never heard wow. from anybody. Yeah. Well, see, it was a different administration at SNL when I was there. It was a, 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 a comp- Lauren Michaels was not there. It was a guy named Dick Ebersol. And so he was there for those three years that I was there. And then when he left, everybody who was on the show left. Hmm. Um, the, the, actually, I think the whole cast, to tell wow, you the truth. Wow. And, he, and then Lauren came in and did his thing, which is understandable. So, but I, no, I was not, I was not even remotely crushed when that mm-hmm. happened. Oh, and were you think. excited then to be in New York and to be like, were you, were you trying to be in theater then or were you? I was trying to be in, I was trying to get jobs. I was yeah. auditioning and having no success. None. 
Was Seinfeld the next big project? No. What happened was I went to L.A. for pilot season. They used to have mm-hmm. pilot season. Yeah. Remember pilot oh, yeah. season? That's what brought <laughs> me at 12 years old to okay. L.A. <laughs> right. So, but I don't think there's pilot season anymore. Uh, there is, it's, there's vestiges. I think there's, really? a, I think it's like there's still a time. There's a period of time but in it's which it's kind yeah, of scattered. It's now. all mushy. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, and I went there and I did get a pilot. <clears throat> and it was a spin off of Family Ties. And it didn't get picked up, but it did get me noticed by mm-hmm. uh, more people at NBC. And, and then I got another series that was short-lived. It was a, a two years I w- uh, called Day by Day, and I was the snarky neighbor next mm. door to a, uh, a, day care, a preschool. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so that's, you know, things started to happen. Um, you know, I wasn't like, you know, huge, famous person at all, but I was getting work, and that was uh, meaningful. <laughs> Is yeah. it true that you were you were about to do, like sign a development deal with Warner Brothers before you did sign? Yeah, yeah, right. So then yeah. you definitely were like you were. Well, doing stuff. after I did uh, Day by Day, then Warner Brothers wanted to make a a, a development deal right. with me, and we did. We made a deal. I had a creative out based on the material that was being developed, and it turned out I it, it didn't work out this material, and mm. so I did. I did uh, bow out and a. Maybe two days later, I got these uh, wow. uh, Seinfeld scripts, Seinfeld Chronicle scripts sent to mm-hmm. me by Larry David. But what was interesting is that then um, Warner Brothers threatened to sue me <gasps> because, oh, because the... they thought that I had pulled out of the deal because mm-hmm. I had gotten these other scripts. Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. When, in fact, that hadn't happened. And I was really scared uh, because, you know, it was Warner Brothers. No, that's <laughs> horrifying. Yeah, that's terrifying. Horrifying. And I yeah. was just this girl who was an, an actress. You know, I mean, I wasn't like, I didn't have, um, I, 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 I felt very small. Mm. And uh, because I was. And, um, and in fact, I had, you know, representatives who were saying to me, you better just give them their money back, give them their money back, you know? Whoa. And uh, and, I, and I said, but if I give them the development money back, which, by the way, won't that imply that I did something dishonest, that I broke the mm-hmm. contract? Mm-hmm. And they're like, just, just do it, just to, you know, get rid of this problem. And I called because it didn't sit well with me. And so I mm-hmm. called Gary Goldberg, who was the head of... He's the guy behind Family Ties. He was the creator. He's since passed. Wonderful human being. Mm. He did Family Ties. He did Spin City. Um, he was a huge force in in at NBC and in television specifically. And I called him and I told him this story. And he said, you know what? I don't respond well to bullying. So just tell him to fuck off and don't give him their <laughs> money back. And it really... It, it, it really emboldened me to stand up for myself. Mm. And so that's what I did. And they just wow. went away. That was that's the end of amazing. it. Wow. Yeah. Julia, yeah. that's incredible. Yeah, it is incredible. It was a he that was a seminal moment for me when he said that. Because it was bullying, by the yeah. way. Julia, when we heard that you might come on the show, I started to rewatch Veep. I watched it the first time, obsessed with it, one of my favorite shows mm-hmm. ever. Thank You're you so, so much. brilliant in it. Um, in the rewatch, I was watching with my sister, actually, we were just in France together. We were like crying, laughing at the scenes between you and Tony Hale. They're just so mm-hmm. good. And I so I had sort of two related questions. One is like, how did you and Tony get through those scenes? And I won't presume that it's him. Who is the actor that you've worked with that, like, makes you break the most? Those are sort of two things I was wondering as I was watching. Mm. Oh. Well, I don't know how Tony and I got through it because we had so much delight <laughs> in making so that good. show and coming up with all of the bits and bobs of physical things that we mm. sort of uh, discovered in rehearsal. And, um, you know, it was like we were doing a... A dance, you know, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we have. He he would really break quite a lot, but mm. I would break too mm. because he made me laugh. So I was just mm. I don't know what to tell you. I was just uh, um, in, enjoying it 
beyond belief. And he mm-hmm. definitely, uh, he's the one who, who certainly has made me laugh. Well, I mean, in recent, yeah, the most, I mean, for, for sure. He's just, uh, it, it, it is, his performance is, is so sublime mm. and, uh, and so authentic and tender, and, and, and that's who he is. He's a very uh, tender, wonderful guy. God, you should have him on this show. I've always been so him fascinated him. No, by him. I yeah. love him. I mean, ever since Arrested Development, like I. Oh, just, you need to have him on this show. Yeah, I would. Because this is really, this is like his uh, talking about middle school. Ooh, oh, all right. Okay. You know, I was thinking about that before we had yeah. you on, and I'm, now, I'm now glad it's just confirmed. confirmed it. yeah. 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 Okay. Julia, I, just, I don't know why I want to point this out, but I feel like he's always in your face too. Like I've never he seen is. two <laughs> characters, and he's just like always physically. And I just wondered, it's was, so it, was that ever uncomfortable to film? Like, <laughs> no, I loved every so second of it. Oh. I loved every it, second. No, the closer really the dancing. better. Like yeah. you said, it's like a dance. Amazing. I mean, it's not like a dance. He was like, oh, yeah, you know, always yeah, right. yeah. you, finding ways to. Yeah, he had like a crush on you. He's always trying to like touch you an extra second. It was so interesting. <laughs> Julia, so you've good. been in so many, like, uh, several iconic comedic franchises in American culture. And I I have to bring up Seinfeld. I love Seinfeld. I told her I not to do it, it but she's I really breaking. wish you would not discuss it. <laughs> Sophie! It was that in the contract. Like off limits. <laughs> I will never talk about that show. I love it so much. I watch it with my husband. I want to know, was there a moment when you realized like, oh, this is, this is huge. Like this is going to be a cultural phenomenon or was it just kind of, did it just happen? The first time I, it sort of truly struck me was when we were doing the finale. We shot the show at CBS Radford in Los Angeles and, and we were on stage nine, which you could see the, from the gate of the, of the studio, you could see the entrance into stage nine. And so when we were, uh, so when we were doing the finale, they had to put up um, big barriers by the gate wow. because there were people on the other side with long lenses trying to take pictures of who was going to be in the finale. Mm. Wow. And I remember thinking, seriously? <laughs> I mean, does everybody, I mean, come on, really? Do you give that much of a shit? I mean, you know, it's just, yeah. uh, I, 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 and, and then I remember thinking, wow, I guess this is really a big deal. I mean, it was a big deal to me personally yeah. because I was doing the show for nine years. So it was my, my heart and soul, of course. Mm-hmm. But to see the uh, impact in that moment, that's when it kind of first struck me that, that this was maybe ginormous. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And I mean, so long lasting. There's only a handful of shows that I think have been that long lasting and have picked up new audiences like generation, yeah. <laughs> generation after generation. But there's also just nothing like it. I mean, I, yeah. it's just. It's a yeah. funny show. It's, there's it's, no it's, doubt. Yeah. Funny's funny. Yeah. Funny's yeah. funny. No, and I mean, it's like, it's just, it's plain. It's, it's, it's a rarely objective tr- fact. <laughs> it's just <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not show. anything else. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Julia, I'm sorry to go back to Veep. I did want to ask you one other question because you're sort of sure. famously political and activist. Um, I was looking at your Instagram and it's like so you give so much real estate to promoting social causes. Yeah. And your character, the administration that she's part of is, is you know, abhorrent, I might say. Yes. Um, but at the time that you started playing the character, you know, there was one administration in place and then the political situation in the U.S. started to change and things that felt like satire in your show started to feel like this is what happens in real life. Correct. And I was wondering how it if your feelings about the character changed and did you ever start to feel nervous sort of as the political landscape changed while you were doing that show? It, I, I, I'm not sure I felt nervous, but I did start to question how we really could pull off this satire mm. because, uh, you know, the Trump administration was, was doing really a better version of our show, mm. except it was <laughs> tragic. <laughs> And not funny at all. So that yeah. yes, you know, uh, uh, our the satire of our show, uh, the tenor of it, kind of changed, and and it was like we needed to um, uh, change, outdo them. Right. It was more of a challenge, and uh, and sort of one of the reasons we kind of stopped doing the show. Mm. Not the only reason, but one of them. Yeah. But it sure was fun, I'll tell you, man. I just loved making that fucking show so much. I really <laughs> it's, did. It's very special. I did. I mean, yeah, and, uh, yeah it was great. 
So does Baltimore feel kind of like a, a home away from home now? Yeah, the first f- uh, four years were in Baltimore, okay. and, then, and then we moved it to Los Angeles, okay. and and uh, which was nice because the the bulk of all of our uh, um, actors and writers at that point actually were in Cal- California, so. Hmm. Uh, it was not everybody could be with their families. Yeah, it was actually. That's, yeah, that's it was. A long it time. was hard to be away. The romance of being on vacation wears off. I mean, yeah, on location yes. wears mm-hmm. off uh, pretty quick. The uh, the one thing that was great is that we really bonded as a, a cast mm-hmm. and as and, and mm-hmm. with the writers as well. We were sort of we all kind of clung to one another, and uh, and I think uh, that showed up on screen. Actually, mm-hmm. there yeah. was a, a familiarity that we had with one another that was something we could really tap into, which was nice. Yeah, Julia, I, I heard you share in another interview sort of a comparison between um, how you approached your breast cancer diagnosis and a time when you had to make a recovery in the ocean. And I wonder if you can sort of tell that story and tell us what the metaphor was. I was in the ocean um, uh, and I was swimming around. I was far from the boat. um, And uh, we were actually, my husband, this was many years ago. I mean, I think I was like, uh, really, I mean, I was like in my 20s. Anyway, whatever. And so we were... um, Doing this, it was a science boat, actually. Okay, none of these details matter. What am I doing? Okay, so anyway, we're on. Taking notes. We love it. We love it. Yeah. (laughs) What month do you think it was? (laughs) I'm trying to remember what bathing suit I had. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Exactly. And I had one of those snorkels that goes. Uh Anyway, so I'm I'm, I'm tootling around in the water, and um, my uh, husband comes to the bow of the boat, and he goes, Jules, I don't want you to panic, but you need to come back to the boat now. There's a shark in the water. Oh, my God. Right. Doesn't that just make you die? Did your heart just drop? That? Like what? Dropped. Yeah. <gasps> dropped. Oh, my God. And so I thought, okay, there's the ladder. And I was far. Okay, I'm telling you, I was oh, far yeah. away from the boat. I thought, okay, there's the ladder. I see it. I'm just going to keep my eyes focused on the ladder. Actually, mm. as I say this, I can feel my heart racing. Yeah, that's intense. Wow. And so... <clears throat> How were, can I? This is a detail I do want to know. How were you swimming? Was it like a. <laughs> yeah, because you're you know trying I mean? not to uh, draw the shark's attention. Yeah. You have to I was that doing uh, the. Yeah, I was trying to actually swim calmly. And mm-hmm. I was doing. Uh, which is. Uh, freestyle. 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 Mm-hmm. I was swimming freestyle because wow. that's. I can get. Fast. I'm faster. faster. Yeah, right. Yeah. Doing, the mm-hmm. crawl is not going to take me there quick enough. <laughs> yeah. And oh so. Or the butterfly. Can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can do it. I don't know. That's a lot. You're it's making a lot commotion. of noise in that yeah. water. <laughs> but how, so did anyway, you, I did just you kept see my, the shark? Had you, did, did you see the shark? Or you were just like, okay, I need to swim. No, my husband saw it. I did not mm, see it. Okay. And my plan was not to look at the shark. Yeah. yeah good my plan. plan was to look at the ladder. <laughs> yeah. And so that's what I did. I just kept my eyes focused on the ladder. And I was just thinking about the ladder. Literally. It was like... You know, probably without even realizing it, I was just meditating on ladder. Mm. And um, so then when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, which was like having a shark in the water, Mm. um, I just focused on the ladder, which was just getting through this in uh, increments and and onto the ladder and onto the boat. Not considering the danger, not focusing on the danger, but focusing mm. on the uh, <laughs> the way out of the danger. Mm. And that's what I did with, that's the mindset that I had when I was uh, going through my uh, cancer romp, as mm. it were. <laughs> cancer yeah. romp. Yes. Yeah. That's a new cancer one. Romp. That's a new turn of phrase. It is. I but hope I think it doesn't that's... take off. Uh, yeah, <laughs> take it, off. it's a viral moment that we will exploit. <laughs> yeah. Your insensitivity <laughs> to I'm allowed to do that. People. Yeah, actually. Yeah. I'm allowed to. You're, I'm you're playing right. the cancer card. We'll yeah. let the internet decide. <laughs> Julia, I think that's such a helpful obviously the patterns of thought that we have like influence illness. I think like healing is is also tied up in like the mind and our will. So I think that's really a helpful mindset like to focus on healing instead of illness somehow. Like that helps the healing process. Yeah, and also I think, um, you know, little steps, focusing on the little steps Mm -hmm. uh, to get you there. You know, manageable parts as uh, 
my son's uh, teacher used to say when a project would feel too overwhelming, let's mm -hmm. just break it down into manageable parts. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and that really applies. God, does that apply? That applies to so many things in life, and it's so useful. It's so useful yeah. from the mundane to the most critical um, aspects of life, I think. We all confront death in ways big and small all the time, and yeah. eventually we all do it. What's 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 been your your views on mortality and and spirituality over time, and mm. and where do you land now? My father passed away. Uh, what year are we in? Twenty twenty three. So he passed away in uh, about seven years ago now, and um, and I was with him when he passed. Hmm. And uh, that was an extraordinary, and and I spent a lot of time with him uh, during his sort of the last couple months of his life, uh, leading up to his death. And I found it to be a remarkable experience to have been able to be with him during that time. And um, this is going to sound odd. I actually. Isabel Allende and I sort of spoke about this on the podcast. Uh, uh, being with him it and waiting for him to pass, what felt very much like waiting for somebody to give birth. Mm. It, there was a similar... Um, I, I'm not suggesting it was a joyful thing, mm. but there was a similar feeling of awe and mystery about it. And now as I say it, I start to cry. But yeah. it really, it um, the, the parallels are there for certain. Yeah. yeah. And um, so I am a believer in those mysteries, mm. you know. Mm. I'm, I'm not a, a religious person in the standard sense of the word, but I, I certainly... I mean, something's going on we don't know about, oh, yeah. right? That's what I would say, something yeah. for sure. And I'm interested in that, and I have enormous respect for it. Yeah. I'm a Baha'i, and there's a prayer in the Baha'i writings. There's a line in it that says, like, make them or make me a confidant of thy mysteries, which I think mm. is so beautiful. Yeah, um, it's gorgeous. Mm. Yeah. That's beautiful. Julia, we have a final question that we ask every guest, which is if you could go back to your 12-year-old self, spend a little time with her, what would you mm. say? What would you do? Um, I would tell her it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. <laughs> That's it. That. Yeah. yeah. Do you think she would yeah. listen? Definitely not. <laughs> 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 you have to pass through. You've got to pass through the the difficult stuff to get to the yeah. uh, to get to the calmer place. I think. Julia, this has been such a delight, such yes. an honor. Thank you so much thank for you. giving us oh, your thank time. Thank you. It's been so nice to talk to you guys. And I, uh, yeah, what a nice conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. You can watch Julia Louis Dreyfus's new film "You Hurt My Feelings" in theaters now. You can listen to her show "Wiser Than Me" wherever you get your podcasts, or you can follow her online at official JLD. Davis is going to keep coming in, like. Uh, there's some some things I need to <laughs> to handle in view well, of the camera. You gotta intro him at the end. You gotta intro him. <laughs> no, at the he'll end. he'll kill me if I do that. <laughs> Will he kill me if I do it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's turning red. This is his actual middle school crush, basically.